Hello and welcome to Crime Through Time, a weekly snapshot of crime history. In December 1969, Arthur Hosen was a man in financial trouble. So he and his brother hatched a plan. Kidnap the wife of Rupert Murdoch, the new owner of the Sun newspaper and the News of the World. On the 29th of December, they broke into St Mary's house in Wimbledon and kidnapped the lady inside. It wasn't Anna Murdoch. A case of mistaken identity, the result of one of the worst planned crimes I have ever seen. Let's explore the kidnapping and murder of Muriel McKay. Arthur Hosen was born in Dow Village, Trinidad in 1955. He moved to England as a tailor's cutter. He completed his national service but was thrown out of the army in 1960. He would marry a German lady named Elsa. He had dreams of country living and the life of a gentleman. In 1967, he bought a 17th century farm set called Rook's Farm, set in 11 acres of land near Stock and Pelham in Hertfordshire. He had borrowed heavily from the bank and the property needed significant renovation. They kept pigs and chickens and Arthur made trousers. He was nicknamed King Hosen by the neighbours for his pretentious nature and ideas of grandeur. He applied to be a member of the hunt, but was declined because he couldn't ride a horse. The weight of the debt was heavy on Arthur by late 1969, but then one night, watching TV with his younger brother, Nizamuddin, the perfect solution presented itself. On the 10th of October, David Frost interviewed Rupert Murdoch on his Frost on Friday programme discussing the recent publication of the Christine Keeler memoirs. Arthur realised that Rupert was a very wealthy man who would pay handsomely for the return of his wife if she was to be kidnapped. The brothers set about planning the crime, confirming the home address of their target, obtaining a photograph of their victim, studying the family's routines to pick the perfect opportunity. No, they did none of those things. But on the 29th of December 1969, they followed Rupert's Rolls Royce to a house in Wimbledon, assuming this to be the family home. But Rupert and his family had returned to Australia to spend Christmas with family, lending the luxury car to his friend and colleague Alec McKay. Inside was his wife Muriel, who Arthur and Nizamuddin would kidnap. Muriel and Alec were both born and raised in Adelaide, Australia. It had been his work with Rupert as a newspaper executive that had brought the family to London in 1958. With them came their three adult children, Jennifer, Diane and Ian. Alec returned home at 7.45 to find his front door unlocked, the telephone ripped from the wall, the contents of Muriel's handbag thrown onto the stairs and a rusty meat cleaver on the floor. The fire had been left burning. He rang the police from a neighbour's telephone. The police weren't convinced it was kidnapping and were asking if it was possible Muriel had simply left her husband. Alec called the editor of The Sun and asked for the story to be run the next day, which angered the officers, but it got them to take action. Around 1am the following morning, Alec received a call to his repaired telephone from a phone box. We are Mafia M3 said the male caller. We tried to get Rupert Murdoch's wife. We couldn't get her, so we took yours instead. We have a million by Wednesday, or we will kill her. They had obviously realised their mistake and were hoping that they could still cash in. They called again, saying that Alec would receive a letter from his wife, possibly to answer the request for a proof of life. A scribbled note arrived that morning. Please do something to get me home. What have I done to deserve this treatment? Clearly written under duress. Over the next 40 days, M3 made 18 calls, talking with Alec, Ian and Diane. Three letters were sent with postmarks in Tottenham and Wood Green, demanding money and continuing to threaten to murder Muriel. Enclosed were notes written by Muriel begging for them to comply and three pieces of fabric cut from her clothes but they didn't leave any instructions on how to deliver the ransom. The family appeared on national television, pleading for Muriel's return, speaking directly to the kidnappers. 
Her doctor falsely said that she needed urgent medical treatment or that she would die, hoping to motivate them into giving instructions to end the situation and bring Muriel home. On the 1st of February 1970, a ransom drop was attempted. M3 gave instructions to Ian for the money to be dropped off in a suitcase at a crossroads on the A10. The brothers were scared away because of an accidental high number of police officers in the area. In an attempt to keep the drop quiet, detectives hadn't informed local police and the ransom drop was unsuccessful. Another attempt was made on the 6th of February. Diane Dyer, the couple's daughter, was specifically selected by the brothers to make the drop. M3 instructed her to place a ransom about £500,000 in fake banknotes in two suitcases and place them in a telephone box in Church Street, Tottenham, where she would receive the next instructions. Disguised police officers made the drop. At 4pm, a call was placed to the telephone box, telling Diane to take the suitcases to another phone box in Bethnal Green. Another call gave a third location in Epping. A final call told her to take a taxi to a used car yard and garage in Bishop Stortford, Gates Garage, and to leave the suitcases next to the minivan on the forecourt. Detectives were conducting surveillance in the area. They observed a man in a blue Volvo with a broken tail light number plate XGO994G, passing the garage four times between 8 and 10pm. It passed a final time at 10.47pm, but this time two men were in the car. Unfortunately, the detectives hadn't learned any lessons from the first drop and didn't inform the local police. Joan and Peter Abbott saw the suitcases and reported them as suspicious, and they were picked up and taken to the local police station. The investigation was quick from here, as the brothers were in their own car. It was registered to Arthur Hosen at Rook's farm. When the police searched the farm, they found an exercise book from which paper had been ripped to send the letters. Arthur's fingerprints matched those on the letters. Twine and a roll of tape were found that matched those left behind in the McKay house. Nizamuddin's voice matched the recordings of M3 that police had made on the numerous calls. However, no trace was found of Muriel. They searched the farm for weeks and yet couldn't locate any remains, but they were certain that she had been killed. Arthur and Nizamuddin were charged with murder, kidnap and blackmail. Their trial began on the 14th of September 1970. The brothers pointed the finger at each other, but Peter Rawlinson, who led the prosecution, proved Arthur to be the dominant force in the crime. They were convicted on all counts on the 6th of October 1970. Arthur was sentenced to life for murder plus 25 years for kidnap. Nizamuddin was sentenced to life for murder plus 15 years for kidnap. The trial judge, Justice Shaw, said, quote, Their conduct was cold-blooded and abominable. End quote. They never disclosed what happened to Muriel or where the remains could be found. They were sent to Wilson Green Prison. An unsuccessful appeal against their sentence was tried in March 1971. Arthur applied for parole in November 1987 and September 1994, but were denied. He died in prison in 2009. Nizamuddin served 20 years before being deported to Trinidad. In 2021, Nizamuddin told a Queen's Council that Muriel had died of a heart attack soon after being kidnapped and he provided the details of the location of the grave. The family acted on the information and a one-week search was conducted at Rook's farm in February 2022, but nothing was found. One theory is that she was fed to the pigs and guard dogs and that is why no trace has been found of Muriel at the farm and the horror of doing so is why they didn't publicly admit as to how they disposed of her remains. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and let me know what you think of this case in the comments below and I look forward to welcoming you in the next one. <music>